On January 16, 1917, the German Foreign Office sent a telegram to Mexico inviting them to invade the United States should the United States choose to join the war against Germany. The German Foreign Office didn't know at the time that the British had intercepted the cable and shared it with the United States, and the infamous Zimmerman telegram would be a central part of the events that would eventually draw the United States into the Great War. And that would impact a good many other telegrams, because it brought to a head a simmering question about whether America's telephone and telegraph wires should be controlled by the government or by private interests. Since its creation in 1885, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company had come to so dominate the telephone market that there were calls for antitrust regulation or an outright government takeover, and the U.S. entry into the First World War gave an excuse to do just that. In a little-remembered action in 1918, the American Postmaster General took control of America's electronic communications. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The company that would become AT&T began as a project by the Bell Telephone Company that created the first commercially viable nationwide long-distance network. In 1885, the company was officially incorporated as its own company in New York as the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. In 1899, AT&T officially purchased the assets of American Bell to dodge the corporate laws of Massachusetts, which were restricting its growth. In 1907, AT&T President Theodore Newton Vail announced his philosophy of one policy, one system, universal service. At this time, AT&T's strategy shifted from strangling competition by refusing to provide equipment and other pressures to outright acquiring the competition. Vail believed that this would be beneficial to the consumer and the business, and said that the American telephone system must be sufficiently strong to constitute practically one system, intercommunicating, interdependent, universal. In 1909, AT&T merged with Western Union, which made their network considerably more efficient, but antitrust action was on the rise. In 1911, Standard Oil and American Tobacco were broken up, and in 1912, Progressive and Antitrust President Woodrow Wilson was elected, and the U.S. Attorney sued AT&T under the Sherman Antitrust Act in Oregon. In 1913, Wilson's Postmaster General, Albert Sidney Burleson, ordered a special committee of the post office to look into the advisability of a government takeover of American electric communications, saying that the telephone has now become an indispensable aid to business and a means of social intercourse to which all classes properly aspire. To avoid being broken up, the company entered into negotiations with the government, leading to the 1913 Kingsbury Commitment, negotiated by AT&T Vice President Nathan Kingsbury. The question of whether telegraph and then telephone lines should be private or government controlled had been discussed in Congress for 70 years. In the 1840s, Kentucky Senator Henry Clay said that such communication could not be trusted in the hands of private interests, and that such an engine ought to be exclusively under the control of the government. The Post Office report concluded, quote, If something were by nature a monopoly, it must be government run. There is no other option, unquote. In fact, most other countries had already nationalized their telephone and telegraph service. The United Kingdom had done it that very year, and it had reduced rates. The Kingsbury commitment was intended as a third way, where AT&T could be a regulated monopoly. They were required to sell Western Union and could only buy new companies with permission from the DOJ and the Interstate Commerce Commission. In general, they were only allowed to buy a company if they sold a company. In practice, AT&T was able to continue to grow by prioritizing which companies to buy. The commitment also required AT&T to allow other companies to interconnect with their lines, which discouraged other companies from developing their own long-distance networks. Publicly, the country wasn't convinced that government could run the lines better, and Vail and AT&T continued to speak against what Burleson called postalization. Even progressives didn't agree to the takeover and preferred a solution of regulation. One newspaper argued that government service would be a joke as compared with present service. If you don't believe it, just try the government service, telegraph and telephone, in Europe. This commitment served to give AT&T a positive regulatory environment and end any chance of a takeover. Despite that, Postmaster Burleson continued to advocate for telephone operations to be postalized and run as a kind of public utility. And then in 1917 came the Zimmerman telegram and U.S. entrance into the war. Burleson saw an opportunity to get the networks handed over as a wartime measure. If he could prove that the government could run it effectively, he could push to make it permanent. The Zimmerman telegram played an important role because Burleson was able to argue takeover as a national security issue. 
Additionally, railroads and radio were quickly nationalized as wartime measures. In 1918, he was contacted for his opinion on the Aswell Joint Resolution, proposed by Louisiana Democrat James Benjamin Aswell, which would give the president power to take control of any telephone, telegraph, marine cable, or radio system to guard the secrecy of military and government communications and prevent communication by spies. Burleson wrote to Congress that there is not a nation engaged in the war that entrusts its military or other communications to unofficial agencies, and that he urged the passage of the resolution to safeguard the interests of the country. Burleson's tenure as Postmaster General was already fraught with controversy, both contemporaneously and by later scholars. He is perhaps most infamous for instituting segregation into the Postal Service, which had been integrated since the Civil War, and advising Wilson to segregate the rest of the Civil Service. In 1915, he had cracked down on seditious and treasonable newspapers, and he censored almost anything anti-war which came through the Postal Service. The Aswell Bill passed, and on July 31, 1918, Wilson handed over control of the wires to Postmaster Burleson. Burleson worked quickly to prepare the post office for the new responsibilities, and established a wire control board eight days before he officially took charge. Many had thought that Burleson would fire Vale, but instead Burleson was impressed. He later said Vale was a great, unselfish patriot. Burleson retained all of the company's employees and turned over control from the wire board to a board of industry executives. The government also promised to maintain AT&T's network at their own cost, keep dividends to stockholders the same, and to compensate the company for any expenditures incurred during its ownership. One of Burleson's primary goals was to consolidate the system, and he said that government ownership will undoubtedly cause the coordination and consolidation of competing systems wherever possible. He pushed for companies to consolidate the system to promote unification and eliminate waste. Everything was in pursuit of consolidating the network until he could make his control permanent and it would run more efficiently with fewer companies involved. He would eventually approve 34 consolidations. He also ordered the telegraph system to be operated as one, arguing wartime considerations required it. When the commercial cable company resisted handing over control of its marine cables to Western Union, Burleson removed its officers, board of directors, and owners from any supervisory control and handed the wires to Western Union himself. Burleson also inherited a number of labor issues. Telegraph workers were pushing for a strike to force Western Union to recognize the union. They had postponed two scheduled strikes in the summer of 1918, but still planned on going through with a strike later in the year, despite public resistance due to the war. Burleson had told Congress before the war that if nationalized, telephone and telegraph employees should not be affiliated with any outside organization, that their sole allegiance and loyalty should be to the government. Burleson thought striking against the government was impermissible and forbade workers from striking, although that did not prevent work stoppages in the spring of 1919. He did raise operator pay to try to appease workers, but argued to President Wilson that it was simply impossible to bend to operator demands during the 1919 strike. Burleson did increase profits by instituting service installation charges as well as increasing rates across the board. Though he argued the rate increase was necessary to continue to extend service to rural areas and obviate financial collapse, it antagonized consumers who have been led to believe that without private industry and the desire for profit, rates would fall. Still, Burleson was unable to run the lines profitably, largely because the price of copper skyrocketed during the war, making the maintenance and extension of lines prohibitively expensive. The government lost some $13 million while it ran the lines, and according to the terms of the agreement, they had to reimburse AT&T for those losses. Burleson pushed for permanent control over the networks as early as December of 1918, but soon the tide turned against him. With the armistice in place and negotiations moving forward on a treaty, continued control was no longer a wartime measure. Burleson's management had united every interested party. He had infuriated the public, state regulatory agencies, which had failed to reverse rate increases, company owners, and labor unions, who were preparing for a second strike. On May 19, 1919, Vail and another industry leader officially requested the return of their companies. Congress began hearings in June, and the telephone companies began lobbying frantically to get their companies back. Despite his protests, Burleson couldn't stop the tide. He was criticized for censorship, for the increase in rates, and for inefficient management. One speaker at the hearing said that, I do not believe that anything in the last 12 years has done more to weaken in the minds of the people of that state the theory of regulation than the acts of the post office department. 
Legislation was passed to return the wires to their previous owners, and Burleson duly returned them on July 31st, just one year after he had officially taken them over. America's dalliance with government-controlled telecommunication networks was actually relatively unique in that most countries had nationalized them earlier and held on to them longer. The United Kingdom didn't re-privatize British telecommunications until 1984. AT&T actually came out ahead on the deal. They managed to sidestep the increased costs during the war and continue growing. By 1934, AT&T controlled more than 90% of the U.S. telephone market. Of the billion dollars earned in the industry in 1934, AT&T earned $990 million. And their size and scope would continue to raise questions about regulation until the landmark 1974 Department of Justice case that would lead to the breakup of the Bell Network a decade later. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>